favorite people in the MOCA community. We're so excited to welcome you back for this special MOCA Spotlight series. Uh, we started this uh, series of conversations in large part uh, due to the outpouring from the broader MOCA community, both nationally and even internationally, when the Five Alarm Fire uh, occurred at MOCA's collections. And such an outpouring, people were wondering about how to salvage artifacts, they wanted to hear more about the journeys of prominent Chinese Americans, real pioneers in the story, since they knew that so much of our artifacts are around journeys and oral histories. And of course, we wanted to make it more accessible during this time when we're all um, at home and staying safe, we hope. Uh, so this spotlight series, we featured Calvin Tao, uh, to, an architect and also another architect, Bill Louie, uh, both incredibly fascinating journeys. Um, and Senator May Yi is uh, one that we thought would be especially interesting given the political climate um, and the role that she played in really busting that ceiling as the first uh, elected, um, the first Chinese American woman ever elected to state legislature. That was in 1976 in the state of Oregon. I think Senator Yi, you were like 18 years old at that time. <laughs> 49 years old. <laughs> I know, you, you don't look like you were 49 back then considering what year it is now. Um, but 1976, you broke down that barrier and we love that story so much. Um, so prepare your questions for Senator Yi. You can throw them in the chat. Um, I'll ask them um, through this conversation, but what we thought we would do is get to know Senator Yi a bit. And also this series is recorded. Uh, please share it with young people. Please share it with those who um, may not have access to roadmaps um, for their life or understand that um, individuals who might uh, look like them have paved the way in some way. And I think we really try to create models um, that look more like, um, uh, more like each one of us in different ways to try to help pave the way. Um, but of course, MOCA is always by all for all and uh, we are in this journey together and try to be as inclusive as possible. So May Yi, Senator Yi, my first question, because I know you're sitting in Albany, Oregon, but where do you consider in your heart is home? Do you have one home? Do you have two homes? And where is home for you? Well, my original home was in Shanghai, China, where I was born and raised until I was 19 years old when I came to America for education. My father, was a self-made millionaire. I lived in a very privileged and sheltered life. Our house was a big house with beautiful garden, greenhouse, servant's quarter, large pond in the back with a big barn with three horses. Home in America since 1956 has been in Albany, Oregon. I met my husband in New York and we moved to Albany, Oregon where Stephen built a specialty metals plant in Albany. Living in the countryside of Albany was a big change after 19 years in Shanghai and eight years in New York. See, this was the beautiful house in Shanghai, China, and I was riding, horseback riding with my brother, uh, Jimmy, a year younger than I am, my uh, horseback writing lessons was given to me by a Russian urn colonel. Uh, at that time, there were a lot of Russians escaping from the revolution. So we, we had a Russian bodyguard when we went to school in China and this horseback riding lesson was given by a Russian colonel. Um, my life in China was uh, very 
privilege and very shelter. But in America uh, is, is entirely different. Uh, we have a beautiful house, well, a comfortable house in Albany, and we raise our two sons here in Albany, Oregon. And, and May Yi, I'm so fascinated by both of these photos. I think they really are um, such time um, time sakes in, in terms of, per, you know, just uh, preserving that moment. Uh, and this is, of course, 1947 on the left, 1946, and right before the Civil War, 1949. Um, do you have any recollection of, of, of this period? And was there this, this, this ominous sense um, that this was going to happen? Jap Japan had already invaded China. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about this period when you were a young girl and, and living in this time? Uh, was this a sense, did you have a forbearing that you would be leaving China at that point? Um, your last question was whether I believe I would be living in China. Would you be that you would be leaving China? Oh, leaving China. Yes. Um, well, um, I had no idea that I was going to leave China, except at that time, uh, all the students dream of coming to America for college education. So my brothers were sent by my father to come to America to learn how to do rayon manufacturing because my father owned the first rayon manufacturing plant in China. And I came to visit them with my mother and I decided I want to go to college too. So, <laughs> So I registered myself without my dad knowing it. And then I told him, I'm registering in college, please send money. <laughs> well, that was, but, that was the very, and you went to Barnard College, is that right? Yes, uh, but I want to say very briefly, the time I was in China. Um, well, after we won the Second World War, under Chiang Kai-shek dictatorship, the government was run with extreme corruption. Uh, the poor were very poor and the rich were extremely rich. My brother was kidnapped once for ransom and my father was kidnapped twice for ransom. That's why when we went to school, we went in a chauffeur driven car with a Russian bodyguard so that no kidnapping would happen to my brother again. They always kidnap the number one son for ransom. And on the way to college, the street was strewn, strewn with straw mat, frozen bodies, starved bodies along the road to school. The poor had nothing to eat. They were frozen. They were starved to death. And on the way home, they were all picked up by the sanitation department. At that time, the streets were full of beggars. Every corner, there were prostitutes. Inflation was tremendous. So the situation was very, very sad there was no middle class. It was really fertile ground for communist revolution because the poor were so poor, they lived in mud huts. They used cow manure paddies for fuel and for heat and for cooking. Situation was very sad. Um, since you asked about my experience in China, I want to tell you some of the very devastating situation. My husband, during the war, walked to the war capital. And on the way, he said people had no clothes, no clothing. They used tree box as a cover for their private parties. 
And on the way to walk to Chongqing, they were all very hungry. So finally, he came to a farmer and he asked to buy an egg. And three girls at the same team with him looked at him with big hunger and he had to give that one egg to the three girls who were walking to the capital with him. So I want to show you the shelter and privilege life we had, but there was also very extreme poverty, very sad situation going on at the same time. It's, um, you know, some people have remarked that the last 100 years of history for Chinese, Chinese Americans has been so tumultuous and so yes. volatile and, and yes. massive swings from poverty to, to, to wealth, to back to poverty, to wealth. And I'm just, you know, just placing it again in context for our audience. This photo is from 1946. We just yes. within 10 years, you are in a new, you've, you've been to Barnard, you've met your husband, and now you're in Albany, Oregon, where you're sitting today. And that all happened within 10 years, as you saw a civil war implode China, as you saw China close to the outside world, the mainland. And, I'm, and, and, and what is so fascinating to me is then you raise your family, your two boys, um, your husband, you're in Albany, Oregon, which as many of us know, is not the most densely populated Chinese American community you could find. Um, and tell us a little bit about that. Um, how, how many other Chinese Americans were in Albany, Oregon? Um, you enter your public service life a bit later, but you're making a lot of friends in your communities. And were they welcome to the Chinese, um, your, your, your Chinese, the Chinese, were there a lot of other Chinese Americans in Albany? Uh, there, there were very, very few Chinese in Albany, Oregon. I could count to nine or 10 the most out of say 50,000 population. So it's less than one half of 1% uh, Chinese population. But the fact that I was a Chinese Asian uh, didn't matter when it came to um, election of me as a state legislator, because at that time, people appreciated my service on two local school boards, uh, emphasizing on high quality education and why spending, cost effective spending of tax dollars. They also knew me from my going door to door trying to meet as many people and listen to their concerns from as many people as possible in my district. Uh, so I think uh, quality of your service and your concern about the improving quality of life in your community uh, makes a lot of difference. I love that so much. And I love the photo of you with the students at Clover Ridge. You know, there's been a lot of uh, remarks, you know, Andrew Yang, of course, was the first Asian American to run for president um, in the last um, election. And, you know, there, there, are, there is commentary that there are not many Asian Americans elected um, into uh, public servant seats. And I'm wondering, may, Senator Yi, can you share with us, um, you went door to door and, and it seemed from all of the, the book and the writings, and it seems so natural for you, but many people feel that there are many barriers to entry into political service. Can you share a little bit about your philosophy? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, entry to um, service, I mean, entry to community involvement is really very uh, easy. Uh, the simplest way to entry in service is just to raise your hands and volunteer. 
whether it is at the school level, library, hospital, senior centers, veterans organization, or other worthy costs. There are hundreds and hundreds of organizations that are deserving of your help and, and um, talent. The only limit to entry is your own interest and limits on your time and resources. And there is such a, when I see some of the work you've done and you showed us at the gala, the nickel that was given to you by a homeless man when you represented his needs um, and, and, and your, in your service work. And I'm just thinking, what is the most meaningful role uh, you have had in public service? And when people think about volunteering, I think it's hard for some people to create a space to volunteer in a very busy time, in their busy life, there's always something to do. But can you share with us, why is it so meaningful to serve in the public sector in, the, in that space? Well, um, it, I want to tell you how I get started. I went to Barnard College, a women's college, a small women's college in New York City. Uh, the president of the college said to us in a weekly assembly, every week, she said, use your education and be involved in the decision-making process for the benefit of your community. Uh, his, her message encouraged me to be involved in the school activities when my children went to school. And that eventually led to my running for the school boards. And that led to my running for the state legislature. Uh, the fact that my parents instilled in me the high the principles of high value high integrity hard work and the importance of education helps me to do well um i was elected uh to serve in the state legislature 26 years eight terms uh, of election three two-year terms in the House, five four-year terms in the Senate. I was always elected with high majority votes, twice unopposed. So that goes to show it's very important to work hard, emphasize on high integrity, kindness, respect, and the importance of education. I think we're learning so much and, and, and you're such a living testament of the ability to contribute despite barriers. And, and you mentioned this a bit and it's, you are counting half of 1%, uh, that is the number of Asian Americans in your district when you were first elected in 1976. So how come that didn't matter? you were able to bridge culturally um, to your constituency group. Were there any concerns that at the time, and especially today, when many of us are witnessing and experiencing anti-Asian American racism, heightened xenophobia, why did it not matter in 1976 when you ran for the first time and you were elected that you're that you represent your, your your ancestry had nothing to do with um, your your electability. Well, the fact that I have served uh, thirteen years on local school boards, two local sports school boards, nine years in the elementary school, and four years in the high school, always screaming and yelling for higher stronger 
causes a higher standards for high school graduation and always voting no on budgets that are much higher than inflation and um, incre an increase in student enrollment. It's always emphasizing on getting maximum results for minimum of cost. And um, I think people understand that I was dedicated for high quality and minimum cost, cost effective wide spending of dollars. So, um, and I also went door to door to listen to people's concern. I had a little black book and I wrote down their questions and I respond, I do research and respond to them um, very promptly. I have a rule in the, in the legislature that um, I answer my telephones the same day. I answer my mail within three days after research. So I um, spend Saturdays visiting all the cities and send them regular newsletters about what's happening. So people knew I was hardworking, uh, dedicated in uh, taking in taking care of their concerns. I solve hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, about helping cover citizens resolve problems with government, make sure government was able to make payment and services to people who are much in need and deserving. Um, um, well, dedication in service for the community is very important. It's, uh, it sounds so grassroots and so personal. Yeah. I would as want you as my representative. <laughs> it just seems like uh, real governance in, in my mind. But as, as you know, since your time, um, um, as you've, have you, as you um, sort of still been active in your community, but left public service in, in the formal way, how do you think politics have changed uh, from your perspective? We saw a very tumultuous 2020 and a very tumultuous four years. Um, have recent disruptions made us go backwards um, in fact, I would be happy to go backwards to the style that you, um, uh, Senator Yi, employ to create connectivity and to create community. But where do you see the politics today and, 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 and have they changed and what's the trajectory in your mind? Well, there's no doubt that politics has become very negative and partisan. Compromise seems to have become a dirty word and that needs to change. You cannot consider yourself as a Democrat first or a Republican first. You need to consider yourself as an American first. My test is not whether a bill is good for the party or good for the personal benefit. It needs to be beneficial for my district and for the state of Oregon. So um, it, it needs to go back to working together. No party has all the answers. Uh, we need to work together for the benefit of the country not for the party or for personal benefit. I hear you loud and clear. Um, and I think the, your philosophy on engagement has also uh, allowed many wonderful achievements in, on your record, including authoring the Enterprise Zones legislation to help create jobs in economically lagging areas in Albany and other parts of Oregon, also securing funds for an adolescent drug and alcohol treatment center. 
But I think the one that really stood out um, for, for many of us who have gotten to know your, um, your wonderful accomplishments was in 1981 and the transsexual birth certificate bill. And what, I mean, in hindsight today, of course, we're like, oh, that seems you know, very natural that that would be something that was of priority. But for our audience, that was 40 years ago. And Senator Yi um, was the one who, that, that marks one of her major achievements in 1981 transsexual birth certificate bill. Could you tell us a little bit about the bill for our audience and, and, and some of the challenges you had to go through and what it really did in terms of pioneering um, an impact on the transgender community? Well, it was a very unique bill. In 1981, a constituent called and said, if I would sponsor a bill that would create a legal process to make corrections on birth certificates, I decided that if the court could order names, order legally name changes, there is no reason why they cannot allow a process to make other changes. And the constituent explained that she was applying for a pilot license and she wanted to make a change before submitting her birth certificate for license application. I asked legislative counsel to draft legislation accordingly. When the bill was scheduled for hearing, I asked her to come and in tes testify in support of the bill. I was shocked to see a woman six feet tall with tall hairdo and high heels. As we made our way to the committee hearing, a crew of cameramen, TV reporters follow us to the committee because they heard of this unusual bill. I finally realized this was a bill to allow my constituent who went through a sex change operation to change her birth certificate that stated she was a male to change it to say she was a female. The bill passed committees and became law. Now, today there probably would not be much attention to pay to this bill. But 40 years ago, it made news. The leading newspaper in state of Oregon published a full page article praising me for passing historic legislation. And in the article, my constituent whose name, she asked that her name remain anonymous, considered me as a legislator who represented her constituents in the highest possible manner, knowing that I was a conservative Democrat standing up against my reputation to sponsor a bill for her. But I received tremendous satisfaction in knowing that this step helped her become a whole person after all the difficult procedures she has gone through, help her become mentally and physically whole, whole a person gave me tremendous satisfaction. This confirms my belief that when you help somebody in need, you really gain much more in return. 
Thank you, Senator Yee, and thank you for that tremendously um, groundbreaking and pioneering work um, that we have been able, I think so often we need people to plant seeds and, and you have planted so many seeds in areas where we, we are now really seeing the fruits of um, that, that, that abundant fruit. Uh, you know, even though you spent only 19 years in China, and if I may disclose, and you've shared, you know, uh, more than 70 years in the United States, through many years, you've kept the relationship with China. Um, and you still speak Shanghainese, you speak Cantonese, and you speak Mandarin, um, but you also created friendship. Um, and that's part of the uh, word that you use in your book, East Meets West. Um, can you tell us a little bit your reflections on the changes in China, um, political changes, um, you know, economic changes, even technology changes? Uh, that you have seen in China over the last 50 years and how you saw that sort of impact your impression of what was happening there? Um, it was um, 50 years ago next year that President Nixon went to China and the country has begun to open itself to the West. I'm very proud of what China has accomplished during the last 50 years. I made many trips to China during the past 50 years. And every time I went, I saw impressive improvements. China has made tremendous accomplishments during the last 50 years. They have established public education, reduced high illiteracy, improve health system, reduce malnutrition rates. It is tremendous that they have reduced malnutrition rates for children under five, under five. It is really very impressive. Although there are still much to learn in expanding personal freedom and liability, freedom and liberty but I'm confident that will come in time. I love this photo, uh, Senator Yi, in 2002, about two years after the Women's Conference in Beijing, and when US-China relations seem to be on the up and up and improving many friendship delegations. And I love this Oregon trade friendship delegation. And you know, many things are noticeable here to me. And, and, and I don't know if the population in Oregon had increased that much, um, but you're, you're, you stand out in this photo, which is a wonderful part of um, uh, this, 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 uh, this, this, this photo for me. But what are your thoughts about current bilateral relations uh, between US and China? Does anything keep you up at night? Um, what is the state in, from your perspective on U.S.-China relations? Well, um, it is really too negative. I think it is important that we remain friendly relations with China. It is very important that we recognize national sovereignty, cultural differences, but work on common goals. Um, we need to, we, America cannot be policemen of the world. We need to concentrate in building our own country, emphasize on st education standard, improve productivity and meet global competition and work on human rights and equal justice at home. 
this is like the pot calling the kettle black. We need to work on human rights and equal justice at home and work on common goals, recognize sovereignty, national so sovereignty, and our cultural differences and work on common goals, improve understanding, friendship, trust, trade, prosperity, and world peace. Thank you, Senator Yi. And we can open up, please prepare your questions. We can open up to questions for Senator Yi. Um, but as I look to this wonderful picture of your uh, 50th wedding anniversary, I also see because it's a Lunar New Year, this is a lot of home bows for people. <laughs> so I hope everyone got one. I heard uh, grandma's only giving you home bows until you're 21. Um, so make sure you get, you know, balance that out with your parents uh, until you get married. And just some of the other wonderful pho photographs of uh, uh, Senator Yi at West Albany High School and uh, in Shanghai in 2008. Um, and we can open up the questions to uh, the audience. Would love to uh, for uh, the, the, the Senator Yi to answer some of your questions, especially given the climate that we're currently in. Um, we also have an Asian American candidate running for the mayor of New York City, where MOCA is based. Um, would love your, your, your thoughts on, on, on uh, is it time for an Asian American mayor in New York City, one of the most densely populated um, cities of Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in the country? Senator Yi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, any questions from our audience? Would love to hear any questions you have for Senator Yi. And when was your last trip to China, Senator Yi? Uh, that was 2002. I retired in 2003. Uh, well, if you have time, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, when we visited China the first time in 1992. Uh, the first time we visited China um, uh, with Senate President and Speaker of the House. Now in Beijing, they treated us to their very famous Peking duck for dinner. And before they started to serve the duck, they want to show respect to the Senate president and speaker of the house. And they wanted to serve them the duck's brain first. And none of them wanted to eat the duck's brain. So the speaker of the house said, Senate president is the leader. And Senate president said, speaker of the house was the leader. And I was dying of embarrassment when nobody wanted to eat the duck brain. So I said, they're both leaders. Why don't we ask each of them to eat half of it? And then they nodded their head and said, okay, okay. <laughs> So, so it was very embarrassing at first that none of them wanted to eat the duck's brain. <laughs> I love that story so much. <laughs> and I want to tell you, this grassroots exchange really is quite an improvement in understanding and improving understanding friendship, trust, and trade. Because every time we came home from these meetings, they said to me, May, I didn't know that China has so much history because the, our sister state hosted them to a trip to Xi'an and, and, um, and, and uh, watch all the 
emperor's tomb and the 5,000 buried warriors. They said, we didn't know China has so much history and we didn't know Chinese people are so friendly. You know, the delegates loved the Mao Tai drink they had during the banquet. They love it. <laughs> it's like fire water. They went around and toasted everybody so they could drink more. They say, Minister So um, Gan Bei and Madame So Gan Bei. <laughs> they had such a wonderful time. I think these grassroots exchange really, they do a lot in improving understanding friendship, trust, and trade and prosperity. There are a lot we can offer our agricultural products, our forestry products, and it's very much in need to, to help them with improving their environment. I think that we need to do a lot of um, work together for mutual benefit and common goals. Senator Yi, we have so many questions for you coming in now. Um, and I, I touched on this and thank you for sharing those stories because it seems like when one-on-one -on -one you build a friendship or a relationship, um, there, it's very powerful. Um, what we're witnessing today, and I alluded to this, is a heightened um, anti-Asian American racism. And we've seen this terrible videos and it is the social media platform that we, we do are able to see these, um, especially elderlies, elderly um, Asian Americans in Oakland, um, in LA, in, in Boston, in New York City, who have been the victim of um, attacks uh, because of their Asian ancestry. And there's a question here in terms of, do you have any suggestions for us um, to find the best ways to help and to advocate and to fundamentally try to erase this racism um, from, from, from the bottom and so that it does not happen. What, what are some suggestions you have um, and to fight xenophobia? Well, I think that's a very good question. I believe that from my life story and my experience, I believe that more members of the Chinese American community needs to run for elective office. Chinese Americans have been very prominent and successful in business, science, engineering, and the arts, but we have not had the same success in government. The best way to have our voice heard and to make sure the Chinese American community has equal opportunity and equal justice is to be at the table when decisions are made. It only, to, it only takes a little hard work and determination to be involved and start back on the road to elective office. If an unknown immigrant housewife from Albany, Oregon can do it, so can you. You're so exceptional. Even listening the comments on this is just, you're such an inspiration to all of us. And again, if, if, if you were uh, running for a state seat today in 2021, uh, it seems, okay, that makes sense. But you ran in 1976 in a community that had less than one, half of 1% 1 of Asian American and you did so much to bridge understanding and cultural understanding. And you know, one question is, you know, what do you think, what do you feel is your greatest legislative accomplishment? 
Well, I feel that serving the serving my constituents who have problems with government gives me the biggest, biggest satisfaction to cut bureaucratic red tape to help them resolve problems with government. It gives me tremendous joy and satisfaction to be able to get government payment and services to people who are much in need and deserving. Um, well, uh, I can give you hundreds of examples. Uh, I, uh, it comes to mind my example of um, helping to solve, to reduce excessive regulations against major employer and put people out of work. Uh, so helping the citizens, helping the large number employers solve government problems have been my major uh, work and satisfaction. Also like helping the homeless um, person to gain some benefit, low rental benefit, uh, or my major role and duty. It brings me every satisfy, satisfactory resolution brings me a big smile. <laughs> And you know, I think you're so infectious with your compassion and your warmth. Um, and I wonder as a final question, and, and many people have asked about the, you know, the barrier for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans to you know, serve and have more political power. But I wonder in response to that question, but also more broadly, what is your message for us today? What are some, ad some advice that you can give us that you want to share from your life story looking back. And just in 1946, when you were on the horse, I, I, I wonder if you had the vision for the incredible public service life you would you know, embark upon. And uh, it's just so remarkable. And I wonder we can learn so much from you and, and, and move forward and, and become more active and volunteer. But what would you say are the main takeaways that we can take with us about your life journey and, and what we should remember and keep in mind? Well, um, I'd like to quote Barnard President's inspirational message, use your education, be involved in the democratic, in the decision-making process for the benefit of the community. I also like to quote President Kennedy, his saying that, think not what the country can do for you. Just think what you can do for your country. I also like to quote my parents' teaching of high integrity, hard work, and the importance of education. Now, for the ones who are interested in running for elective office, I have three advice. Study economics, say yes, and put people first. We love that so much. Uh, thank you. So, so again, study economics. <laughs> Put people first. No, that that that's that's wonderful advice. And say yes. And say yes. And you know, I think what what um what we've also noticed and what you've shared with us today is you're extremely hardworking. Um, it seems like you're extremely compassionate, 
and that you have a heart for service. And I think that those things are things that I will take away um, from, from you, Senator Yi. And, and you know, responding to emails, responding to calls within the day, responding to things mail within three days, but not after you've, not before you've done research. Um, yeah. And I think it's always, it sounds like you're always encouraging us to move the ball forward, um, but also not create bureaucracy to really know who our, our, our public is. Um, and, and I also think that unfortunately we often see abuse of power and that public servants abuse their power, but, but what you've done is really, you know, place on that pedestal is this, the service component that you're elected to serve. And, and I'm so inspired by you. And also we have the wonderful Portland Chinatown Museum here and Jack, Jackie Peterson Loomis is on the call and she's saying what a powerhouse you are and what an inspiration. And I really wanna echo um, Jackie's wonderful sentiments. And for those of you who are calling in from Oregon, please, once Portland Chinatown Museum resumes you know, normal hours, check out their website, please visit them. Um, and we, we love to uh, partner with all the historical museums all over the country. And, and Jackie is so incredible with the work she does at Portland Chinatown Museum. But to our wonderful Senator Yi, our inspiration, our first Chinese American elected state legislator from 1976 and the wonderful book, East Meets West. We do have this recorded, please forward it to young people, forward it to others who, who may wanna uh, you know, just know that it is possible. Um, and Senator Yi broke down a lot of barriers and broke a lot of ceilings, and she accomplished a great amount for Chinese Americans, for her constituent groups, and for America. Senator Yi, thank you so much. Happy Lunar New Year. Thank you for joining us today. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for the honor of joining you this afternoon. And Senator Yi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, our MOCA Legacy Awardee from 2019. Everyone stay safe. Um, the Golden Ox is a beautiful year uh, and keep eating rice cakes and long longevity noodles and dumplings. And we'll see you again for our next Spotlight series. And go on to our new website, mochanyc.org, M-O-C-A-N-Y-C.org. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Senator Yi. Thank you.